Greetings from the Asian Productivity Organization Secretariat. Welcome to all viewers to this APO's Productivity Talks, a series of discussion on the topics on productivity. We are broadcasting this event live from Tokyo. So our discussion today will be on the interconnection between productivity and innovation. Innovation and productivity are both important for attaining high and sustained economic growth. Innovation itself is also responsible for a pattern of growth and structural transformation that leads to rapid and sustained technology, technological change and better employment opportunity that at the end will result in rising incomes and in poverty reduction. So in other words, innovation affects productivity growth. So in this talk, we will focus on the need and importance for innovation in generating consistent productivity gains. How have countries around Asia managed to do it successfully? And what are the challenges that need to be addressed that deter innovation in the, um, in the region? To discuss about this interesting subject, we are joined today from New Delhi by Dr. Amit Kapoor. So good afternoon from Tokyo, Dr. Kapoor. Good afternoon, please. Glad to have you here today with us in this talk. So just a brief introduction about Dr. Amit Kapoor. He's a honorary chairman of Institute for Competitiveness in India, a visiting scholar at Stanford University, president of India Council on Competitiveness. And he is also editor in chief of Thinkers. He's also a chair for the social progress imperative and shared value initiative in India. He's also currently an affiliate faculty at the Institute for Strategy and Competitiveness at Harvard Business School. So before Dr. Kapoor start with his sharing, I would like to inform viewers that today's um, session will be interactive. I'm inviting viewers to leave comments and questions in the live chat below. So I would like now to request uh, Dr. Kapoor to start with your presentation and your sharing. Dr. Kapoor, please. Thank you, Mr. Buana. This is, uh, it's an absolute pleasure for me to be here today and talk about issues relating to productivity and innovation. Uh, so uh, if you really look at this whole idea of uh, competitiveness, uh, the idea of competitiveness is all about productivity, the way with which we actually use our resources. And when you talk about resources, it effectively means that the way we are actually talking about our land, labor, and capital. That's a traditional economic view, but the question is that countries which are able to use these resources better are always able to look at uh, uh, what you call a standard of living, which is going to be higher. And when I say standard of living, uh, it would actually be in terms of, say, higher wages, uh, the higher returns on capital that you're actually going to be employing to uh, returns on natural resources and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, uh, if you really look at it, the, the challenge for countries is going to be that how do they really surmount this? Or how do they really move forward in terms of improving productivity or improving the value extraction from the resources that we are really talking about? How is it that we are able to best use the resources that we have? That is our land, labor, capital. The traditional view has always been about land, labor, capital. But today, I think there is a fourth pillar which has got added to it, and that is about data. And data is actually going to be one very strong thing in terms of how countries really use that resource and how they really create a competitive advantage or, uh, for themselves. But coming back to this whole idea of productivity, the question here is that productivity depends in terms of like, what is it that we do or create value from the products that we have, the uniqueness and quality. Uh, and digging deeper into this whole idea of uh, uniqueness and quality, the question is always going to be asked, or that is begged to be asked is, who makes the best amount of money or who makes the most important money through the value chain of the product that is actually getting created? So if you really talk about, say, something like the Apple, uh, value chain, close to about uh, 85 to 90 percent of the value actually gets retained uh, outside of the Chinese system. So what it means here is that, yes, the, the level of productivity that happens there or the value the level of value extraction that's happening on the Apple value chain, it is actually residing somewhere else. It is either the brand, it is about, and that brand is about uniqueness and so on and so forth. And when you really look at digging further onto this, 
when you talk about competitiveness, competitiveness is not just about uh, that you just talk about nation as a whole. You have to talk about nation in terms of the aggregate units of that nation itself. When you talk about a place like India, it is just not about uh, India per se. It has to be understood from the perspective of Indian states, Indian cities, and look at a smaller level of geography. So when you talk about all this, uh, this is this is where we have to look at competitiveness. And then, of course, when you talk about uh, uh, competitiveness per se, again, the larger point is that uh, why do we even talk about it? We talk about it for a simple reason, that it is about providing the best environment uh, for people to really operate in. So companies or countries are competing amongst each other. Countries compete to provide the best environment. They compete to really create a situation wherein then enterprises can actually come in and invest. So this is where we actually talk about the whole idea of microeconomics of competitiveness, because at the end of the day, all countries are competing is to create better environment uh, in their uh, location for uh, firms to actually invest. But now this is a larger view of competitiveness per se. And then when you really talk about this larger view, there are four pillars which are actually going to really drive how things happen. Uh, in fact, one of the best examples that I always say is that it's the local conditions which always create that context of improvement of things. In fact, uh, I'll come back to that idea itself, but the four pillars for competitiveness are factor conditions, that is land, labor, capital, data, as I said, the related and supporting industries in terms of the clusters uh, that we are actually talking about and the depth of clusters that actually exist. So it is just not about, oh, I'm uh, actually going to be a person who's going to be making say cameras but there are so many other things beyond the cameras because the camera will have the lenses the move the, the uh, film strips or whatever you really talk about the ecosystem is actually going to be how to, that how do we create that whole cluster across it because there is going to be a value addition that happens across the board the next thing is about context for firm strategy and rivalry because the more the competition the better it is for the firms for a simple reason that if you're competing then the only way for you to be successful is going to be about innovation this is where innovation becomes exceedingly important and the last but not the least is about demand conditions the sophistication of local demand will always create a factor for enterprises to move forward because if you're uh, if the demand conditions is not very sophisticated, if the uh, people within the country are not asking for the best of products, then that improvement will not happen. Let me give you an example from India itself. Uh, India is one of the largest automotive markets in the country or in the world. But what we see here is that we also end up seeing one, the most unsafe cars on Indian roads because the enterprises who are operating here do not actually focus on uh, what you would call a safety for a simple reason that people have not been demanding for it. Uh, similarly, if you really talk about conditions for demand, uh, Japan, for that matter, uh, has been at the forefront for creating newer edge, newer technologies, newer solutions, because they were all, there was always a requirement for that because people wanted more sophisticated set of products. Fax as a product did emerge out of Japan in terms of like because there was a huge requirement in the 1980s for that. Similarly, when you talk about a place like Finland, uh, a very small uh, country, uh, but a very influential country and a very important country from a mobile uh, telecom revolution perspective. And why did that actually, or why did that revolution happen there? That revolution happened there because the local conditions required that. Because uh, Finland or Finnish people wanted to actually communicate between uh, their families, their people. Uh, the the local conditions were not very, uh, very, very sophisticated or very comfortable because there was always this fear that the uh, Russians will actually come in annex. So they wanted to actually have a system where people were able to communicate. And when that was happening, so they created a solution for mobile, and that is where things have actually moved on. So what we are really saying is, it is all about an integrated system that everything creates or pushes the whole idea of innovation forward. And when you talk about uh, improving competitiveness, competitiveness is always, and when you say competitiveness, what is one single parameter that we have to really look at from a competitiveness viewpoint? The single parameter that we have to look at is about GDP per capita. And when you talk about GDP per capita, what you would see is that in terms of, say, innovative capacity is always going to push the Thing forward because when you have innovation, innovative capacity, that's when competitiveness improvement is going to happen, and that is when prosperity would actually happen. So there is this whole huge uh, 
uh, aspect that we have to look at. And we need to understand that it is innovative capacity which is really going to drive things. And when you talk about innovative capacity, what is it that drives that innovative capacity? In fact, one of the most interesting models that we have to look at is the whole idea of technology tolerance and talent. Uh, and then, of course, territorial assets. But 3T becomes very, very important. So what drives innovative capacity is technology, adoption of technology, new age technology that are really going to come up, uh, tolerance to ideas. In fact, places which have done exceedingly well over a period of time are places which have always seen tolerance to ideas and tolerance to unique set of ideas. This is where, in fact, if you really look at countries which have done exceedingly well over a period of time, they are the set of countries wherein tolerance to unique ideas have always been there. They will always look at perspectives from others. They, they will question what they're actually seeing. So the ability to question, the ability to look at assumptions is something very, very powerful that we have to look at. And third and uh, last, last but not the least is about talent. How sophisticated your talent is. What is it that you're able to do with the uh, talent that you actually have? So if you're able to train your talent well, that is when things would actually start moving ahead. But then uh, in terms of the innovation productivity nexus, there is a very clear nexus that actually exists between innovation and productivity. Innovation encompasses the ability to drive growth without a doubt. And then when you really look at productivity processes may become stagnant or decline over a period of time, but innovation provides for that uh, uh, upgradation. Uh, having said that, when you talk about innovation, innovation should not necessarily be just looked at from a perspective of, oh, so there is this technology which is really going to move things forward. Innovation has to be looked at from a perspective of business models as well, or processes that you actually look at. Because I think what has happened is that the biggest challenge in the world today is that people tend to believe that innovation is just about technology. No, innovation is just not about technology. Innovation is also about processes that we really talk about. Uh, and how do we deliver those uh, products? So when you talk about it, it's about a very simple thing. When you talk about innovation at the firm level, one is that I can actually create a new product. I move from a basic way of cooking food to say moving into say something like microwaves or whatever. And at the end of the day, I can create a much more sophisticated solution uh, in terms of pro uh, for what people actually want. It might not be technologically oriented, but then it, there is a solution that can actually get created, which is going to solve a certain problem. Uh, say a very simple thing like say sharing taxis or uh, what you call as Ubers of the world. Uber is just on a technological platform, but it is not a great technological solution. It's a business model idea that actually happened. And then they, that really changed the way people uh, move from one place of the country or one place of the city or in the city to the other part of the city. So there, this was a very interesting, very powerful example, which was enabled by technology on data that was there. But at the end of the day, it was all about business model innovation. So innovation is about uh, technology, processes, business models that we have to really look at. And then we have to be very respectful of that. I think we just should not really say that technology is the only driver. The next thing, if you really look at it, is that uh, you have to really look at focusing in terms of how countries look at this whole idea of uh, competitiveness and issues of productivity. So there has to be macroeconomic policies that would actually function and work for countries to really move forward. Uh, so it is at the end of the day, it is about what countries do is to enable to provide enabling conditions for innovation to move faster. Uh, faster. Uh, and how do they actually do that? Uh, but before we answer that question, there is also something very important that we have to understand that there are two sets of things in terms of innovation that we really talk about. And I did give you a precursor to one of those ideas, but then it is about inherited prosperity and created prosperity. Inherited prosperity is that I'm just going to be exploiting land, labor, capital, uh, and then that's where it is. But created prosperity is where firms will actually create solutions which are going to be unique. So if you really look at it, like when you say inherited prosperity, countries which are focusing on inherited prosperity, these are the countries which tend to have huge levels of disparity. If you really talk about a country like, say, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, fairly prosperous as a country, but there is a whole huge divide between the rich and the poor that actually exists. Uh, and because what happens is when you talk about inherited prosperity, it is fundamentally that uh, the resources or the resource-based industry is always going to get controlled by very few people. So if you talk about oil, oil is going to get controlled by very few people. And then there, of course, the disparities will actually start rising. So inherited prosperity has a genuine problem of that disparity will actually rise. But when you talk about created prosperity, this is where firms will actually start creating solutions. This is where entrepreneurship also comes into action. This is when you're able to actually see 
a huge shift that there is a new man on the in the block or a new kid in the block who comes in and he is actually able to create a solutions which is fundamentally different say amazon as an idea was something that got created in less than 20 years or 30 years ends up becoming one of the richest but he is a person who's actually created a solution for people for problem that they were actually having and that is what actually moved ahead so what we are saying here is that created prosperity also enables uh, what i call uh, wealth creation for people better distribution or distributive idea of how things are going to happen you can actually create solutions which are going to be localized and things but at the end of the day the government plays a very strong role here the government plays a role in terms of saying creating a conducive environment uh, for uh, or conditions but just just going deeper into this conversation if you really look at say global innovation and if you wanted to understand innovation scores according to the global innovation index uh, and across different sets of countries of course this index actually looks at issues like say infrastructure institutions r and d what we see is that there is a huge difference across the board in terms of how the scores happen and what matters here if if i'm really talking about say apo member nations like so say, say from bangladesh to singapore what we see is that countries like say uh, uh, what we call locations like say uh, uh, singapore or you talk about japan or malaysia they actually are into a one set of bracket and then of course on the other side you have places like say, sri lanka pakistan bangladesh uh, which are at one end what we what is the difference here between these two sets of countries the difference is something very interesting and what i was really talking about from an inherited prosperity and created prosperity view when you talk about a place like say bangladesh or pakistan they are they are clearly looking at say inherited prosperity as an idea they have low cost labor and they actually exploit that low cost labor so they fundamentally create solutions which are based on low cost resources so they they are fundamentally creating their advantage through labor arbitrage but when you talk about countries like singapore japan uh, and things like so what they actually do here is that they are talking about beyond the labor arbitrage this is where they create solutions which could actually be based on business models which could actually be based on technology uh, or process enhancements and so on and so forth so how many of us could have actually thought that a singapore as a country could actually be so prosperous in less than 50 years or 60 years of its independence so they have done something fundamentally unique they found a solution which was unique becoming the hub or the transportation hub to the financial hub and they have done something very very amazing so what we are saying here is it's about created prosperity it's not about inherited prosperity whenever you are actually talking about inherited prosperity there is always a, a thing or a resource curse kind of a situation that will arise what will happen is that you will stop or stagnate at a certain level if you want to move beyond that you will have to talk about innovation you will have to move through those stages of development and those three stages of development as a lot of people would actually say from being a factor driven system or a factor driven economy to an efficiency driven economy to an innovation driven economy that's a journey that each one of us or each one of the countries would have to follow when you talk about countries like india india is somewhere at the cusp of uh, we are getting closer to an efficiency driven economy and i think the next stage for growth for india is actually going to be moving towards innovation driven economy uh, i'm not saying in fact one of the points that i actually did say was uh, that each country cannot be just looked at in under one simple umbrella it has to be understood from its aggregated measure as well so you might actually see pockets of huge innovative capacity in a country like india you have places like bangalore pune which are huge pockets of innovation and then you will also have laggards uh, out here so that is what is actually going to be very interesting and that's the same thing that you actually see in nations you will have places which are going to be laggards and then you are going to have countries which are going to be way ahead of innovative capacity and that's exactly visible across the world and across member states for apo as well but what are those enablers of innovation so in fact human capital investments knowledge workers business environment and safety and legal environment are the enablers of innovation very very clearly but if i really want to look at it this is also driven and on these uh, metrics we have to understand that the innovation policy which has to be created by the governments or that is what they have to really create an environment for companies or enterprises to do well is about research education finance and industry and when you talk about it like government can support innovation in two ways one is directly and indirectly uh, when you say directly it is about investing in technology and directly is to create an environment uh, to do so but when you talk about dimensions of innovation policy 
So it's about incentives to support innovators. And I'll go deeper into one of each one of these. So when you talk about incentives to support innovators, uh, it is about supporting innovation in terms of, say, ease of doing business in a certain set of country. Because at the end of the day, how easy is it for me to actually create enterprises, to re create solutions, and so on and so forth. In fact, if you really look at it, like in fact, uh, I have looked at this uh, data in terms of, say, enterprise creation. Say, a single location like Hong Kong can actually have far more uh, enterprise creation uh, than a country like Bangladesh itself. So you would see large enterprise creation that happens in a very simple uh, city location in terms of uh, uh, what I call uh, firm creation. And why does that actually happen? Because it's about ease of doing business in terms of how registrations for businesses can happen. And that's also a governance thing that has happened here. But at the end of the day, the next thing is about establish institutions to facilitate research and trade. Uh, R&D becomes an exceedingly important point. You know, like the challenge that we see uh, in terms of like, what is the difference in terms of, say, the investments that actually happen in R&D across the world? In fact, uh, I was just looking at some numbers in terms of, say, Israel, which is one of the most innovative countries in the world. It, it, close, it spends close to about 4.9 to 5% of its GDP on R&D. But when you talk about a country like India, we spend close to about 0.8% of our GDP. So that means if you really want to facilitate R&D, what happens is that you have to spend as a government uh, and you have to really invest in that capacity. Japan spends close to about three and a half percent. And that is what, and the results are very, very clearly visible. And when you say spending three and a half percent, five percent or one percent, the thing is that who's making that spend? Uh, in countries like Israel, Japan, what we see is that uh, it is the corporate sector which is spending a lot of money in R&D. But in a place like India, what we see is that it is the government which spends the massive amounts on R&D. The corporate sector actually makes a very minuscule uh, what I call contribution. So what we also see is that how corporate behavior can actually have an impact on how growth happens and how R&D can actually be driven, how innovation capacity can be built. So countries do enable, the government does enable, but at the end of the day, it is also about cooperation, which will have to invest. You know, like this, this takes us to a very important debate because a lot of times, there is always this negative point. Oh, what is it that the country is doing? The country can only do so much in terms of investment. It is, again, the actors, which are the firms, which will have to really focus and move forward onto this. The next thing that you really talk about is provide environment that supports innovation by removing obstacles uh, faced by companies. And that is about regulatory environment. So when you talk about regulatory environment, it is in terms of like, what is the ease of doing business that actually exists? How easy is it to invest? How easy is it to actually move your goods from one part of the country to the other part of the country? How easy is it to actually export? And so on and so forth. Uh, of course, there is a very clear thing which actually goes, which says that oh, countries which have done well over a period of time, they always used to have a protective environment. But at the end of the day, they will have to open up. So I think today, in today's parlance, in the globalized world, what we are seeing is that the free flow of information, land, labor, capital, and of course, data is actually going to drive a lot of things. So the environment will have to get supported where the global scale information sharing happens, and everything gets shared equally, the information gets shared equally, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, invest in creation of knowledge workers. This is something very, very important. I think the biggest driver for any country to innovate and emerge out of, say, if you want to say that there is a country which has huge population and poverty or the income disparity actually exists, it is about investing in creation of knowledge workers. And that is where you have to invest in education. That is where you have to support a university system. In fact, the larger thing is that how much money are you really spending on human capital in research? Uh, so if you really look at, uh, the member states itself. So uh, on the Global Innovation Index, and if you really look at the scores, this becomes a very important thing that uh, Republic of Korea, say uh, South Korea, actually spends a lot of money and lot creates a lot of focus on uh, what I call investing in its people. And that is what we are actually seeing. India also does that. But then, of course, I think if you're able to move forward, then it is going to be stunning. And when you talk about outcomes, it's also going to be about understanding the educational outcomes and outcomes from learning that happens. Uh, so how the gross enrollment ratios are changing and how is it that you're able to focus? When I'm saying this, in fact, you know, like I, I'm a firm believer that there are two factors which need to actually be taken care of if you want to make a country great. And, uh, and that is going to be one is going to be on education. The second one is going to be on healthcare. 
if you're able to get these two pillars right, then a lot of things actually start falling in place. Uh, and what are the steps that are there to foster innovation? Like one is, of course, increase in collaboration between institutions, cohesive policy that actually exists, focus on domestic educational institutions, institutionalizing science, diversify to develop high tech products and exports, and probably even business models and solutions around it. And uh, of course, promote new innovations and developments for high things. But at the end of the day, I did start that innovation is an exceedingly important point. And there is a huge aspect that there is dual capacity of innovation. And when you talk about dual capacity of innovation, you know, like what is what is the challenge today that we face as a world? That we have to talk about two sets of progress, like economic progress, and the other one is social progress. So when you talk about economic progress, this is where we talk about issues like GDP. And when you talk about social progress, you have to talk about uh, conditions of uh, well-being that people have. Like they they have to talk about education, healthcare, infrastructure opportunities that actually exist for people, the freedom and choice that you actually have. So if you really talk about innovation, innovation has the ability to take care of both these things. And when I say taking care of both these things, because economic progress will happen because innovation is there. And when you talk about social progress, you're able to create solutions for people. So in this pandemic, I think there is something very important that has happened. Uh, it has exposed a lot of problems that the world sees, and it has also created a lot of solutions. Uh, when you were talking about, say, poverty, typically we were only talking about poverty from a perspective that poverty is just about monetary poverty, in fact, disparity in incomes. But this pandemic is exposed that you, you can actually have poverty at the level of, say, internet access. There is huge lacuna in internet access that actually exists. Uh, but at this, or there are issues pertaining to, say, knowledge gaining, knowledge sharing, schooling, or whatever. But countries which actually had the basic social infrastructure in terms of providing telecom services, they have been able to take care or, or they have been able to manage challenges of this pandemic far easily and far better. Uh, countries which actually had a better uh, uh, healthcare system, they have been able to take care of uh, their people and whatever. And then, of course, because if you have a great social uh, what I call, uh, infrastructure, what happens is that it is actually going to have an impact on the economic progress of a country as well. So innovation does help you in takes, uh, taking care of economic progress and social progress. So uh, that is what we need to focus on. And then, of course, uh, without a doubt, if you really look at it, there is a very, very clear link between innovation and competitiveness at a global uh, level. Uh, so when you talk about global competitiveness scores or index scores and global innovation index scores, what you will see is that countries which actually are competitive uh, they are the countries which will actually have huge levels of innovation as well. So if you talk about this uh, locations, if you talk about your, uh, what do you call, uh, countries like, say, uh, Japan or Singapore or Malaysia, uh, so you or Switzerland, these are the set of countries which are actually having huge innovative capacities and they become, in, uh, they enhance their competitiveness over a period of time. Uh, so the question is going to always be that is there a causality or whatever? But what I really mean to say here is, that there is an in inextricable link that actually exists between these two. Innovative capacity is going to drive things for the future. And then if you really look at uh, global innovation index scores and uh, GIA among uh, APO countries, so uh, this is where you will actually find that higher income economies, particularly Singapore, Japan, and Korea, had higher innovation scores. So in fact, countries such as Japan and Korea consistently perform well on well both in terms of productivity and innovation. So this is what is going to be the driver uh, that we are really going to be seeing. And then, of course, as you said, like I said, like GDP versus social progress. Of course, as you increase your GDP, uh, your social progress will also be something very important. That will actually, there is a turning point that actually happens. There is an access that after a certain point, uh, the social progress is not going to happen as quickly as or as rapidly as possible. But at the end of the day, uh, until a certain point of income, GDP per capita, your social progress happens. And that actually happens because countries will focus on creating social solutions or social infrastructure. But one of the most important factors that we have to look at is, uh, is about IP regimes. When you talk about innovation, I think what needs to happen is that we have to look at how, how robust your intellectual property regimes are. Because at the end of the day, uh, when you talk about innovation, when you talk about intellectual property, that can actually be the basis for competitive advantage. And when it is the basis for competitive advantage, it becomes very important for firms to protect their uh, basis for competitive advantage. And if they are able to protect it, uh, that means 
uh, they are able to do well. They, they are able to extract more value. They are able to make more money over a period of time and so on and so forth. But this is where a country needs to fundamentally bring in a very strong IP regime and move things forward. So overall, if you really look at it, at the end of the day, if I really want to say that there are two or three big points. So it is about innovation, which drives uh, what do you call competitiveness of a country. And when you talk about innovation, it is going to be about land, labor, uh, sorry, uh, it is going to be about three T's. That is technology, tolerance, and talent. Uh, how countries can actually provide the best environment. And when you talk about innovation, innovation has to be at the level of products, processes, business models, and across the board. It is just not about engineering and everything. It is about creating solutions for the people. And at the end of the day, it is all about economic progress and social progress that has to come together. And innovative capacity can actually help us solve a lot of social challenges that actually exist. Uh, so this is uh, where it is. So these are some of the ideas that I thought I'll share. And I presume my time's up, like as Mr. Bhuvan had actually said, I had 30 minutes to share my views. Uh, so over to you, uh, Mr. Bhuvan. Thank you, and thanks a lot for the opportunity. So thank you so much for your um, sharing and insight, Dr. Kapu. I really um, personally enjoyed it. So allow me now to um, move further toward the discussion, a Q&A of this talk. So the first um, question that I would like to sort of ask with you is about the dual capacity of, of innovation. You mentioned about that in one page of your presentation. And um, compare, let's say, to 10 or you know 20 years ago, I think we are now becoming more and more innovative and productive, right? But at, at, at almost at the same time, um, you know, within the same time frame, perhaps the inequality, you know, in, uh, in any way you measure it, the inequality in income, in access and everything has also been widened. Um, so the data shows about that. So why do you think there is such a paradox? And, and can really innovation remedy the inequality? If it is so, then how? Your view, please. So, so Mr. Buana, this is, this is a great question, you know, like, uh, Fundamentally, this is the whole debate that actually happens in the world in terms of like how uh, can innovation remedy inequality? You know, like as I said, like when you talk about created prosperity and inherited prosperity, uh, when you talk about inherited prosperity and control of resources by a few set of firms, that is when you will always see huge levels of disparity that is actually going to happen. But this is also a very limited view in terms of, say, looking at GDP as one of the ideas. I think there is GDP and there is about social progress. So GDP on a Gini coefficient, you will always see that this in, uh, inequality is rising. But at the end of the day, we should also look at measures which are beyond the GDP. We have to look at measures which are in terms of saying social progress as measures or opportunities as things. And then innovation does help in really moving things forward, in creating that access to services, in creating access to uh, information. So when you talk about innovation, like our technological upliftment, the technology has actually given access to people uh, in so many ways to say banking, or if you talk about education and so on and so forth. So what it does is that it actually enables a lot of people, it enables their lives. And this is where they actually are able to get far greater opportunities. So to say that innovation is the reason for disparity, I think I will not agree with that. I think it, the disparity happens because resources are controlled by very few enterprises. This is where countries will have to really create policies where resources are not controlled by very few. This is where uh, the antitrust laws become exceedingly important. But then at the end of the day, uh, in, in innovation does help people in getting better access to information. This is where they are able to play the game better. This is where they are able to get more involved in the economic activity of the world. So if you really look at the last five or 10 years, I think this has actually given rise to a situation where people are able to get more involved in what they were actually wanting to do or how the countries were actually growing. Uh, so over a period of time, the impact of innovation is not going to be so brutal as we are actually thinking. It is going to be much more bigger as a leveler uh, as a process uh, as we move forward. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it is also about the way we really look at innovation, the kind of innovation that we are really uh, talking about. Uh, but at the end of the day, innovation is going to improve productivity, that is going to improve wealth 
distribution, wealth creation, and better opportunities for people. In fact, a lot of people tended to believe that once computers have come, the banking sector will actually be dead and gone and everybody will lose jobs. Nothing of that sort happened. It actually expanded the market. So innovation expands the possibilities. It, it expands the market. It creates new market spaces. But when you talk about, and this is where opportunities also arise. So whenever you've had the innovation thing, markets have actually expanded. Market possibilities have actually expanded. New segments have actually got created. So this is where the beauty is. In fact, uh, if you were talking about 100 years back, it was far more, uh, of course, the wealth accumulation was not there at the top. If you're really just saying wealth accumulation is an idea uh, versus the quality of life, quality of life has generally improved for people in the last 100 years. Uh, wealth accumulation, of course, you might have seen that there is a larger accumulation of wealth at the top. But at the end of the end of the day, the opportunities are higher and innovation is going to provide that solution. Over to you, Mr. Boana. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we received this uh, one particular question from the live viewers um, in our YouTube channel. Um, this is a question from Mr. Mahlok. I think he's from Malaysia. He's actually asking about the support. So um, what are the effective non fiscal incentive to promote and enhance innovative programs, especially in SMEs. And how do we measure the intensity? This is actually the second question that he has. How to measure the intensity of innovative activities other than R&D investment, particularly in developing countries? Your view on this? So you're right. <laughs> yeah. So when you talk about measuring the intensity of innovation activities, I think it is going to be a question of, uh, I'll try to go back to the whole idea of clusters. The question is going to be that, how well are you able to share information? Typically what I see is that if you really talk about countries like Bangladesh, India, uh, and things like who are still at the cusp, who are emerging, who are growing over a period of time, who are somewhere uh, at the level of what you would call as say efficiency driven system, uh, they are, typically saying that a cluster would be an agglomeration of firms. No, it has to be sharing of information. Whenever you're able to share information and grow on them, that is when things will change. And this is where I'll, I'll always say that you have to understand that knowledge sharing is going to be about, you, you're actually being focusing on a very small part of the value chain, some information. If you really look at, say, the New York Boston belt, that's something very, very interesting. And what we see here is that New York Boston belt in the US has 60 biotech firms which actually work with the university system wherein they share information and that's one of the most resilient clusters that actually happens so it is about uh, where they are able to create newer solutions where they are able to extract better value as they go along and having said that the other thing that the government can actually do is that they have to create the enabling environment and when you talk about say measures such as supporting monetarily or uh, incentives that the government can actually give, there is something much more that the government has to do. And those measures are in terms of saying, oh, can I actually create a, a system wherein information sharing is better, my IP regimes are better, my invest, the regulatory system is better. That is what will actually enable people to come. I think we have to create a situation wherein people become entrepreneurs. I think the world today is facing a challenge, and that is that you have two sets of people. One is uh, job seekers and job creators. But then the larger population is about job seekers. We have to create a thing wherein job creators are the uh, norm. So this is where we have to push forward towards the idea of entrepreneurship. And that is what the governments will have to enable. Because if they are able to enable it, if they, have, they are able to enable this, they are able to provide the right set of environment, things would fundamentally change and move forward. Thank you for that. Um... Uh, the next question that um, I would like to have a discussion um, on with you is about usually the innovation is always taking place at the firm level, at the shop floor. But now these days, the production process itself has become more and more connected, more and more complex and more and more globalized. Of course, there is one a particular disruption from this global pandemic, but it doesn't really um, disrupt the long trend of this interconnection of production. So are these good or bad factors for innovation, considering the fact that there will be an increasing complexity in managing innovation within firms? 
what do you think about this so mr buhara this is again this important point to really understand i think when you really talk about innovation i i don't think uh, that it is a challenge in a globalized world it is it is actually creating situations which are far better now today if you really look at it like if you were talking about 50 years from now like if we were talking about 20, uh, 1950 1960s and 1970s the information sharing was so less uh, that each one of us was effectively running its own battle we were trying to move into a direction trying to find similar set of solutions or whatever but now what has happened is in a globalized system wherein the movement of labor movement of capital movement of resources and sharing of data is so well enabled that means innovation is actually going to be far better uh, or far easier to do than in the past uh, in fact one of the best examples on this if you really look at it uh, in, during this pandemic the discovery of the drug that we are really talking about so multiple drugs have actually emerged over a period of time in fact in less than one year of the pandemic hitting the world we already have a vaccine uh, so this is the beauty of information sharing this is the beauty of the present global uh, globalized system that we are really talking about people are believing or uh, trusting each other they are sharing their information they are moving ahead they finding a solution how many of us could have actually expected that we will find a vaccine in a 12 month period uh, after the start of the pandemic in fact the spanish flu if you really look at the 1918s uh, there was no vaccine that actually got developed uh, vaccine for polio took ages in fact we have still not got vaccine for aids and for of course there is a concoction of drugs so there are many many things for which we have not been able to find vaccine but in this pandemic it's about how people have shared information in a globalized system this is where you found a solution so wherever the conditions are created the challenges are created the world will find a solution so you know like it's always humanity is very very interesting and resilient humanity will always find solutions when it is actually pushed to the wall so it is about that in fact the systems are in place for for better uh, what i call innovation innovation capa capacity finding solutions for the people rather than actually saying it is going to be complex or whatever of course the world is volatile the world is uh, facing some very interesting set of situations and uh, challenges but at the end of the day what i firmly believe in is that we are actually going to be seeing far resilient processes firms sharing information with each other firms working together to find solutions and taking the world forward mr buhana so on the notion of the knowledge worker that you um, also mentioned, uh, what is it actually? Is it just a simply human factor plus knowledge capital? Or is it really something else that um, we can cultivate, the government can cultivate, the country can cultivate in order to um, to climb up toward the um, innovation ladder? And that's the first question. And it's the follow up, the following qu question that is uh, still relevant to that is, is there any particular countries in Asia that you would revert in, in order to show us the best kind of like success story or or the, the success or, or the best uh, story in, in that regard in developing the um, knowledge worker? So Mr. Buana, you know, uh, yeah. So if you really look at this whole idea of say knowledge worker, I think we have to understand that when you talk about people, uh, how do we actually use our human resources a very critical thing in fact at one point in time anybody and everybody was actually wanting to say oh we are going to be working in it and if you're actually working in a call center you were seen as a huge success or whatever but at the end of the end of the day it was a model which was based on labor arbitrage cheap labor and that is where it is but then over a period of time people understood that you have to go beyond it so knowledge worker is a person who is effectively going to be uh, what do you call uh, looking at uh, what do you call creating solutions which are going to be there who is effectively working on r and d uh, who is working in the area of science who is working towards research in terms of say, economics business biology physics or whatever and sharing that information as you are actually going along uh, so if if you really look at it it is not simply just a human factor it is all it's about going beyond those factors it's about uh, people are there but then the question is going to be that how do we actually share knowledge around this so in fact that i did say there are three t's technology tolerance and talent if i'm able to create and enable that environment that is when things will actually go in fact this is about creating a situation wherein we are able to bring different schools of thought together 
In fact, there's a very important point, and that is about the Medici effect. And the Medici effect is that if I'm able to bring sciences and humanities together, if I'm able to do that, I might actually be able to find solutions which are going to be unique. In fact, one of the biggest debates that is actually happening in the world of business education today is that whatever we are teaching today, is it uh, good or is it useless? I think the debate is that it is fairly useless what is being taught today because at the end of the day, you have to move towards giving you perspectives from the field of art, literature, philosophy, and so on and so forth. So what I'm saying is that the solutions will actually come from convergence of ideas rather than saying, oh, there is just one single thing that you'll be actually focusing on. So a lot of knowledge, humans will bring in that knowledge together. In fact, quite interestingly, creating, uh, say, if I'm able to create a solution uh, for, say, creating a building, uh, if you want to create a building which is green and so on and so forth, you can actually learn from how termites live. So if I know how termites live, I can actually get some information from uh, what do you call to give to the architectural uh, people, give to the architects, give to the builders, and they are able to actually construct something around it. Because termites actually are able to maintain temperature within their uh, hills uh, at about close to uh, 27 degrees centigrade. And so can I actually learn from them? And if I'm able to do that, I'm able to find some unique solutions. So that is what we have to look at. So the world tomorrow is about convergence of ideas, bringing different schools together. It's about the Medici effect. It is just not about oh, just silos or whatever. It's about uh, breadth of knowledge that is actually going to be there. And then how you're able to bring all those things together and learn from those to really move the world forward. Mr. Buana. Thank you for that. Um... Allow me now to touch upon the um, on the thing related to technological adoption. So technology is always considered to be a boost for productivity, right? But if it's not all about uh, about technology, um, I've personally I've I've been uh, looking around and there is always this a uh, misconception or misunderstanding, you know, either by the government or the company. In, in the role of, of technology in, in, in pushing productivity? What, 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 what are these things that you have also, you may also have heard the same thing. Could you, could you share with us, you know, what are the common, what, what are the most common misconceptions about this technological adoption in boosting the productivity? Also, you know, like, uh, I think technology necessarily does not mean that it is going to enhance productivity over a period of time. Uh, or it is just going to be the uh, what I call solution for solving the challenges or whatever. In fact, there's a very interesting study. Uh, if I'm not, if I remember it correctly, uh, how Asia works. That's a book that Joe Stockwell wrote, and he gave a very interesting answer there uh, onto this. Uh, places where an agricultural land holding is less than a hectare, and about five to six people work there, the productivity levels are fairly high. And when the land size actually increases, the productivity levels go down. So that means like manual labor can also do something very, very interesting, improve levels of productivity and take things forward. It is about practices that you follow. Uh, so if you really look at technological solutions, uh, they can actually enable a few set of things, but they are not going to be the wherewithal for, uh, or it's not something which is going to solve all the challenges of the world. Uh, so I think we need to understand one thing, and I, I'm very clear in my mind, Technology is an enabler. It is not a solution for anything. You will still have to have people who are going to deliver things on it. And when I talk about the pandemic, you have education. Uh, is technology going to solve education? No, it has to be professors who are going to give the education. Technology will just enable for me to actually go to larger sets of people. I might be able to expand my reach. But at the end of the day, the requirement of the teacher to share knowledge will always exist. So when you are really talking about that human intervention and knowledge sharing, it is always going to be there. Uh, so technology, I think it is not panacea for all sets of things that actually are, are there. And in fact, when you talk about learning, learning is actually going to be about doing things. It's not about that I can learn everything on my handset. No, it is never going to happen. Uh, it, it is possibly one of the most dangerous things also. Uh, so if you really look at it, when you talk about that productivity technology thing, I, I would... And I'm just thinking right now, and that is that how much time am I spending on uh, things like this? So when you are talking about spending more time on mobiles and technological products, it actually reduces productivity of an individual uh, at the end of the day. So it is about 
how do I spend time with myself as an individual? So at the individual level, the effect is different. At the firm level, the effects could be different. At the country level, the effects could be different. But at the end of the day, we need to have a far more semblance to understand. Technology is an enabler. It Solutions are going to be created by humans. You'll have to find how the best solutions are going to be actually created on top of it. Uh, so it's about process. And as I said, it's about products, processes, business models that will actually be far bigger drivers than anything. Technology will always move toward a situation. It's like the Shamtarian view that, you know, like you will always have a better technology. There is going to be a disruptive technology that is going to happen. Then again, disruptive technology will create a solution. But at the end of the day, it is going to be about that how other sets of processes uh, work. In fact, uh, at the end of the day, you have aircrafts, you have aircrafts which fly longer, but uh, you need to have a hub and a spoke system. You need to have a system where aircrafts are able to manage that kind of traffic, how people move. And But then remember, whatever technological solutions we have, if nature plays havoc with us, uh, and then the human race, uh, what do you call, crawls down. In fact, this pandemic, like with all the technological solutions we actually had, has put the humanity on its knees in terms of telling them oh, that nature is far stronger. We need to be far more respectful of what is actually happening right now. Mr. Bumana, over to you. On the issue related to the fin financing, the investment for innovation. So I'm referring to the case of developing countries. They are usually characterized by resource constraints. Um, the support of government is you know, far from optimal because they need to allocate on certain things that they think, you know, it's more important, um, you know, for urgent um, kind of uh, spending, those kind of things. So how can they, do you think, relax this kind of constraint? Any best practice that you would like to share with us about this? Thank you. So, you know, uh, when you talk about financing investments for innovation, how they can relax the constraints that are there, you know, like, there is something very, very important, and two or three things. Each of the countries will have to improve its regulatory mechanisms that actually exist uh, across the board. Uh, today, if you really look at it, like when I talk about uh, you know, places like, say, uh, developing countries, like places like India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and these are countries wherein the regulatory challenges are far higher than most of the other countries that we are actually talking about. So. How do we reduce that regulatory uh, things? And when you talk about resource constraints, like when you talk about resources, like it is resource only about capital? Yes, so capital actually becomes one of the major constraints in places like this. So how is it that we are able to enable capital formation in these locations? So how do we enhance the, uh, what I call, system in terms of, say, uh, venture capital industry and so on and so forth? Uh, and those are the set of things that will happen. So the risk appetite of its people has to be higher. What we have seen is that, that, again, when you talk about countries, like there are different brackets that we'll see. So people we are still at the developing stage up to about, say, uh, $7,500 $7, per capita income. They have far larger, uh, what I call, constraints in terms of like how they're going to spend. They are far risk averse in terms of investing money uh, on innovation and innovative capacity. So this is where governments will actually have to come in through support mechanisms to say, oh, yes, why don't you invest in research? Even if you fail, that's OK. Uh, we need to actually also talk about uh, what you call the social stigmas that actually exist. In fact, if you really look at it, I think we always talk about governments per se in terms of innovative capacity. It is also about social aspects, which actually derive uh, the, the ability to really innovate. In fact, societies which are more hierarchy driven, they you will see that or when I say societies which do not enable questioning, they, they are possibly less innovative than societies which are more questioning, uh, who, are, who have that ability to really say, go ask a question, question every damn thing that has been said uh, from whatever has ever been written in the world to question every uh, damn stricture that actually is there. And then they, they say, oh, yes, we can actually find uh, some things there. So when you talk about uh, resources, resor government is there. Government can enable... The environment they can actually give incentives but at the end of the day we also have to enable the banking sector the availability of finance how governments can enable it how we can actually have the venture capital industry uh, that actually uh, gets there and but last but not the least it's about building trust and trust is so important you know like countries which do exceedingly well uh, on innovation and who are at the helm of 
uh, driving competitiveness and who are at the top in terms of per capita incomes uh, across the world. They are the countries where in the uh, level of trust is exceedingly high. Uh, so countries where people are able to trust each other, wherein the rule of law is there, the legal system is faster, uh, wherein if you have to go to the legal system, the results are fairly quick, then things are going to be uh, uh, much, uh, what do you call, uh, happier and better. Uh, so that that's what needs to be done. So uh, improve that level of trust, information sharing, uh, have a legal system which is responsive, uh, create a system of venture capital uh, or uh, capital formation uh, loans, etc., which is going to be uh, better. And then, of course, information sharing between all sets of people. That is going to be something very important. Mr. Buana. I think now we are reaching toward the end of this talk. Um, I have, I still have one burning question that I have um, that I would like to pose to you. It's actually, what are your advices for the countries that are currently at the bottom rank of innovation ladder? What do they need to do first? And what would their to-do list look like, do you think? So I, I think when you say like countries which are not innovating uh, fast enough or who are at the bottom or whatever, I think they just need to focus on two things. Invest in its education system. Uh, invest the most that you can actually do because if you have the basic social infrastructure of education wherein you're able to reduce uh, the level of uh, what you call improve the enrollment ratios, you're able to create a system that more and more people are going to, going to the university system uh, and wherein the appreciation of different schools of thought is actually there. So you are able to bring in the idea of science, engineering, uh, mathematics, humanities, and everything together. That is really going to be taking things forward. That is what they fo need to focus on. And it is not a journey. Let's remember one thing. When you talk about competitiveness, competitiveness is not a sprint. It's a marathon. You have to invest now, and results are going to happen in five years or 10 years. I think the biggest mistake that countries can actually make, or a lot of people will think, oh, I'm going to do right now, and things are going to happen in a snap. No, it is not going to happen that way. It is going to take ages. If I want to transform a country, it can take up to about 10 to 20 years to transform anything that you're already doing. If I want to change my education system, if I invest now, the results are actually going to happen in 10 years. It's not going to happen right away because it's actually about the rehauling of the complete system that actually happens. So what I'm saying is that invest now and then really move forward in things. And the world can actually be a far beautiful place as we are looking at, uh, and th that's how things would be. I think the key would be one of the key of the messages that you are trying to convey to us is it's still human. Human capital is is kind of, it's also, uh, you also show it in one of your um, a page of the presentation that, that human capital is still important and we need to think, we need to develop that in order to get a better future and becoming more innovative and productive society. So with that, I would like to thank, I would like to express our gratitude to, to you, Dr. Um, Amit Kapoor, for your sharing and also for your time and you know, sharing everything, your experience and knowledge with us. I would like also to thank the viewers for their engagement. We received some questions actually. If you still have the viewers comments and questions, please leave them on our YouTube channel and we'll try to get back to you as soon as we could with the response. So if you would like to receive update on the future of P-Talk and any other updates related to APO, please subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. So with that, I would like to end this um, talk and wishing uh, everyone, including Dr. Kapoor, to stay healthy and uh, productive. Thank, Thank you so much. So kind of you, please. Thank you.